Okay, so, um, so um, welcome, uh, good evening. My name is Magda Tedder. I'm the Schiller Chair in Judaic Studies here at Fordham University. And I'm really happy to, to welcome you to this, um, as, I, as I wrote in my email, a star-studded event. You'll see in a moment why it's, it's going to be so fabulous. Um, so uh, the speakers will be introduced by uh, our uh, colleague Nina Rowe, but I just want to welcome you on behalf of the Center for Jewish Studies. Uh, we, if you don't know us, um, you can just see on the slide we offer a lot of uh, exciting events. Uh, we are uh, really excited about our partnerships and one of the um, fruits of, this partnership, of these partnerships is the, uh, tonight's event, um, working with medieval studies, but also with the Met Cloisters, which I hope will grow into something more regular. Um, but we also uh, have partnerships with Columbia University Israel, uh, Institute for Israel and Jewish Studies and the New York Public Library. We have a New York Public Library Fordham Lecture Series in Jewish Studies. So I hope you'll join us for uh, events. Just next week we have three. Um, each semester there are about a, a dozen of events, so almost every week we can keep you busy. Um, and uh, events cover uh, anything. Last week uh, we had, uh, two weeks ago now, we had a screening of a, of a documentary. So it's films, it's uh, talks, it's conversations, exhibitions, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so I know you're excited for the stars, so I will not keep you uh, waiting longer. I'll introduce Nina Rowe from the Art History Department to introduce our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. It's so nice to see so many of you here. So welcome to Jews and Christians in the Medieval City, Art, Archaeology, and Traces of the Past. And this program, as Magda mentioned, was inspired by the exhibition on now at the Met Cloisters, The Colmar Treasure, A Medieval Jewish Legacy. And it runs until January 12th, 2020. For those of you who haven't um, gotten up there yet, do race right up. Um, and our event this evening is co-sponsored by Fordham Center for Jewish Studies and the Center for Medieval Studies. It's so nice to see so many of our members of the Fordham community here and also um, guests and friends from around the region more broadly. So yes, I'm Nina Rowe from Fordham's Department of Art History and Music. And before I get onto the business of this evening, I wanna take a minute to alert you to an event coming up. I feel beholden to do this, particularly for my music colleagues, um, coming up next Tuesday, October 29th. It's up on the screen at our Bronx campus um, in Duane Hall, Butler Commons on the third floor there, called Memoria Sephardi, Performing Sephardic Songs Through Time and Space. And it's going to be both a concert and a lecture um, uh, presented by Judith Cohen of York University. So we'll now get on to the exciting business of this evening because we've gathered a trio of fantastic speakers to address our theme. We've got F.E. Shoam Steiner of Ben Gurion University and Barbara Drake Baim um, from the Met Cloisters and Deborah Kaplan from Bar Ilan University and each will speak so you know our pro how it's gonna go for about 20 to 25 minutes and then we'll open the floor for discussion among them and for questions from you. So our first speaker is Effie Shoem Steiner. Effie is a senior lecturer in the Department of Jewish History at Ben Gurion University. And he is the author of the book, Involuntary Marginals, Madmen and Disabled Individuals in Medieval European Jewish Society. And it was published in 2008. He's also, of course, published numerous articles and book chapters on Jewish Christian engagement in Ashkenazic cities in the high Middle Ages. He's also had fellowships at Harvard Center for Jewish Studies and NYU's Tikva Center for Jewish Law and Civilization. And particularly pertinent to our program this evening is Effie's work pertaining to the recent excavation of the Jewish neighborhood in the Rhineland city of Cologne. So so I hand the floor over to Effie Shoem Steiner. Okay, um, thank you Nina, thank you Magda, thank you all for coming. Um, it's a pleasure to be in New York, and as you'll see, um, hold on, oops, 
presentation. This one. Okay. As you will see, there's something uh, interesting about talking about Cologne here at, um, in New York City. The wonderful exhibition, The Met Cloisters, um, The Colmar Treasure, uh, The Medieval Jewish Legacy, curated by Barbara Bain, is the reason we're all assembled here today. The exhibition touches on the intricate connections, lives, legacies, and vicissitudes of Jewish existence in medieval urban centers in Western Christendom. Using the Colmar treasure as our point of departure, uh, I intend to explore the intricate relationship between Jews and Christians in, medieval German, in the medieval German city of Cologne. Um, Cologne is located 400 kilometers north of Colmar, down the Rhine Valley, uh, back in medieval times, Colmar, its larger neighbor, Strasbourg, and the middle of Rhineish cities of Worms, Mainz, Speyer, as well as Cologne in the Lower Rhine were all part of the Holy Roman Empire. In my talk, I will briefly discuss the history of how Cologne's Jewish past was revealed, touch on the history of the medieval Jewish community in Cologne, and highlight what I find to be its unique features. The rich archaeological findings from Cologne were unearthed in two archaeological campaigns the first in the mid-1950s, and the second at the beginning of this century. These findings do not exist in vacuum, but must be examined together with textual references from both internal Jewish, mostly Hebrew, sources, as well as sources from the surrounding predominant Christian society, written in Latin and German. Um, the Hebrew sources about medieval Cologne Jewry are scattered in legal, exegetical, and liturgical texts that can shed light on the lives of these people who lived a full and intricate Jewish life in a thriving urban commercial metropolis. By medieval standards, Cologne was much like New York. It's the medie in its medieval heyday, and up until the 14th century when it was overshadowed by Paris, medieval Cologne was the largest metropolis north of the Alps, with about 50,000 people. And speaking about it, the heart of New York City is actually very fitting. When discussing medieval Western European Ashkenazi Jewry, however, we tend to focus on the three famous communities on the western bank of the River Rhine in Germany, the Triad, Speyer, Worms, and Mainz, commonly referred to by their acronym, of the acronym of the Hebrew names, the Shum communities. Um, these are justifiably described as the cradle of the Ashkenazi legacy of learning, liturgy, and Jewish religious steadfastness. This is where well-known Jewish sages, such as the 11th century biblical and Talmudic sage uh, Rashi, had studied, and where Ashkenazi liturgy still practiced to this very day is, was formed. This is also the place where, faced by the crusading mob of 1096, the Jews chose in very large numbers to die a martyr's death. I contend, however, that the Jewish community of Cologne is of no less importance. While the Jews of Cologne have left us a much smaller written legacy than the Shum communities, their cultural life was just as rich. The main difference is that information regarding the Shum communities is relatively speaking very accessible, since the yeshivot, the academies of Talmudic erudition and learning located in these communities left behind much written material. Information regarding the Cologne Jewish community, on the other hand, must be exposed bit by bit, extracted, and refined from various textual evidence and traces of the past found in archaeology and in art. As expected, there are many similarities between the Shum communities and the Cologne Jewish community. However, the Cologne community did, in fact, have its own unique customs, liturgy, and approach to Jewish identity markers. One of these unique features is the role of art and artistic representation in the sacred space of the synagogue. Using art and archaeology alongside references to Cologne's Jewry in texts from the Shum communities, I will attempt to reconstruct traces of this unique past. Let me begin by sharing with you some information regarding the history of Jews in Cologne. The history of Jewish presence in Cologne began in Roman times. We do not know for certain when Jews settled in Ro the Roman city of Colonia a Claudia Ara Agrippinensis. But in the fourth century, there was already a sizable and affluent community of Jews in the city. An imperial decree from 321, from the times of Emperor Constantine, specifically mentions Jews in the city. 
Uh, however, from the fourth century on until the Carolingian period in the ninth century, the Jews seem to be missing from remaining textual evidence regarding this period. In the past, it was assumed that the decline of the Roman presence in the Rhine region, accompanied by the withdrawal of the Roman legions, an important economic component at the time, caused a large part of the population, including the Jews, to migrate south, abandoning the city. It was also believed that Cologne, like other former Roman urban centers in the Rhine and the Moselle valleys, uh, were abandoned during long stretches of the Dark Ages in the wake of barbarian invasions. However, recent archaeological findings and the modern analysis of earlier findings from excavations conducted in the 12th, 20th century, as well as new readings into early medieval sources, have changed the accepted historical narrative. In a 2018 monograph on the history of the city of Cologne from the 1st century BC to the 12th century AD, historian Joseph Huffman has convincingly shown that the previous historical narrative emphasizing the decline of Cologne in late antiquity and the early medieval period was exaggerated. While Cologne did indeed diminish in size and population from its Roman days of grandeur, it nevertheless continued to serve as a local urban center. Its commerce and local industry did not cease, and previous depiction of the city as destroyed and abandoned in ruins should be seriously questioned, if not altogether dropped. While Huffman writes about the general population of Cologne, we are left to ask, what about the Jews? Did the significant Jewish presence from the fourth century continue uninterrupted until the Carolingian period? Were the Jews among those who, during the more troublesome times, migrated south to the Mediterranean basin? Did the Jews return to Cologne only when the region began emerging again as an important center in the late Merovingian and early Carolingian period in the ninth century following the times of Charlemagne? Based on the existing textual or archeological evidence, this, these questions cannot be answered with any form of certainty at present. It is quite possible that the Jewish community in Cologne continued to exist, though its form and scope uh, may have been quite diminished. By the ninth century, however, we begin hearing of Jews living and operating in the area of Cologne, engaged in trade and commercial activity. By the, by the 10th century, we receive more information from inner Jewish sources, the earliest Hebrew rabbinic writing in medieval Europe preserved in Jewish manuscripts hailing from the Jewish communities of Shum. These mention Cologne and its famous super-communal, super-regional trade fairs as a hub of bustling commerce where Jews from the cities along the river gathered forming ad hoc and long-term partnerships and engaging in trade and commerce with Jews and non-Jews alike. Both the lively wool trade and the exchange of precious metal objects, for example, attracted Jewish traders. Cologne Jewish merchants and wool traders are described using ships and river barges in ferrying their merchandise down the river to the sea, to the North Sea, and up the river to the Shum communities. Interestingly, and different from other Jewish settlements in the Rhineland, and this is a point that you should remember, like Mainz and Worms, Cologne does not seem to have evidence of a founding legend from Carolingian times involving learned Jewish families immigrating into the city and founding a center of learning. Is this because the Jews never left? I cannot say for sure. However, as early as the 10th century, with the establishment of the Ottonian dynasty and the, as the imperial dynasty of the Ro Holy Roman Empire, Emperor Otto I emphasized the importance of Cologne and the area around it by appointing his own brother, Bruno, as Archbishop of Cologne. It was at this early stage that the emperor had also entrusted the protection of the Jews and the collection of their taxes to the hands of the archbishop and not any other of the influential local lords, signifying, signifying their importance and his importance. The Jews and the archbishop were thus bound together in a mutual relationship. Jewish sources from the Shum communities, especially early response to literature, indicate that Cologne Jewish merchants felt very comfortable using local justice system. And later Jewish texts praise Cologne's system of justice that oversaw the city's commerce. We may deduce, therefore, that the, Jew, the Cologne Jewish community was a rather old community, I can't say how old, with a strong land, sea, and river mercantile profile, and strong ties 
of relative trust with the local non-Jewish system of trade and justice. But what about the community's ties to the strong rabbinic Judaism that characterized the nearby Shum communities? Once again, we must find the answer than the clues left behind in indirect sources. During the spring and summer of 1096, the Jewish communities along the Rhine and the Moselle rivers were severely hit by an incited crusading mob. Many of the ecclesiastical rulers of the region tried to protect their Jews and in line with the charters and privileges that the Jews held. In some cases, the measures employed were successful. In others, they could not prevent the eventual murderous outcome. Archbishop Herman III of Cologne made extraordinary efforts to protect his Jews, probably prompted by both genuine altruistic motivations alongside an attempt to prevent his fiscal assets from being hit. Herman initially managed to divert the wave, first wave of the crusading mob during the late spring of 1096 and protect the Cologne Jews. In July of that year, when a second wave of bloodthirsty rioters threatened to attack Cologne's Jewish population, the archbishop anticipated the attack and dispersed the community. He sent Jews in groups to some of the fortified locations under his jurisdiction in the city's vast hinterland, for example, Elner, Neuss, and the fortified monastery of Xanten, hoping to keep them safe there. These efforts, however, provide, proved to be futile as the murderous mob roamed the countryside in a bloodthirsty manhunt. Many of Cologne's Jews in hiding were found and murdered that summer. Others died a martyr's death. In these cases, Jews dealt with the rioting mob's demand to become baptized by choosing to kill their loved ones and then killing themselves and sanctifying the name of God, following the example set by the Shum community members earlier that summer. As Robert Chazen has shown, the accounts of these horrible events were probably recorded posthumously by survivors in close temporal proximity to the events in the Cologne community. These texts, however, lost to us, along with the oral testimonies of aging survivors, were used in two of the three Hebrew chronicles that were compiled in the mid-12th century, first by Rabbi Eliezer ben Natan of Mainz, himself a child survivor of the riots in his city, and later in a more detailed chronicle compiled by one Shlomo ben Shimshon in and around the year 1140, 50 years after the riots. The opening sentence of his account regarding the events in and around Cologne is worth our attention. Cologne, the pleasant city where the assembled flock was gathered and heaven brings merit through the meritorious individuals from their emanated life, sustenance, and permanent law, in Hebrew, din kavua, to our brothers so widely dispersed. Note the fact that the community is praised for its economic prowess, its mechanisms of dispensing justice, but not of its knowledge of Torah and erudite learning. This is a very different tone from the ones used in the same chronicles and in Rabbi Eliezer's chronicle describing the other Rhineland communities of Speyer, Worms, and Mainz, where Torah learning is constantly mentioned. Some of the texts of the poetic lamentations, Kinot, that record the events of 1096 in Cologne tell us more about all that was lost. Thus, we may actually learn about what the community had before the riots, adding another piece to the puzzle of the Cologne Jewish community. We hear of the power and prowess of the Cologne community's lay leadership, specifically of one lay leader, a Parnas, who was remembered posthumously as generous, benevolent, protective, and talented administrator, as well as a dispenser of both local and regional justice. This man, Master or Mar Yehuda, son of Abraham, the Parnas, was mentioned both in the Chronicles as well as in the Book of Memory, the Memobuch, that listed the names of those in the community members who died in the events. In the Chronicles, he is mentioned as presiding over communal and supercommunal assemblies held in the Cologne Synagogue, acting as an acclaimed figure of power, but not as a rabbi or a learned man. Now let us pause for a moment and look a few years back to an unknown date in the early 1090s, a few years before the riots. At the time, a man called Rabbi el Yakim ben Yosef, an upcoming rabbi and scholar of Talmud from Mainz, wrote a letter of protest demanding that the communal leadership of Cologne remove stone reliefs of lions and snakes 
that adorned the window frames of the newly built northern flank of the Cologne Synagogue. The rabbi from Mainz thought that the stonemasoned reliefs of lions, and more importantly, those of snakes, probably resembling dragons, were problematic. He was also troubled by the fact that the decorations extended from the walls and window frames and were halfway between the two-dimensional art and three-dimensional graven images. The rabbi didn't question the sincerity of the colonians in their wish to adorn their synagogue, but he was apprehensive of the theological pitfalls. More importantly, he felt that the decorations challenged the demarcation between the synagogue and those of the neighboring churches that were thought were, that he thought were essential distinctions between Jews and Christians. From the information we have at hand at present, it would seem that the lay leaders in Cologne did not respond to his criticism, demonstrating the general low-key rabbinic footprint in the medieval Jewish community at the time. As I told you earlier, Mar Yehuda seems to have been the man, <clears throat> the one, uh, of the main key leaders or lay leaders of the community. In one of the references in the Chronicle, possibly copied from the eulogy delivered when he was martyred, when his martyred body was interned, he is mentioned as hailing from the Israelite, tri Israelite tribe of Dan. This in itself is very odd, as Jews usually refer to themselves as hailing from the tribe of Judah, hence Jews. Um, if we go back to scripture and look at the references to Dan and the tribe of Dan, we will find three biblical allusions that stand out. In the final chapters of Genesis, Jacob ascribes the metaphor of a snake to the tribe of Dan and that of a lion to the tribe of Judea. In Deuteronomy, when Moses dispenses his final words of prophecy and wisdom to the tribes of Israel, he uses the metaphor of a lion to describe the tribe of Dan. And in the Song of Deborah, in Judges 5.17, Dan's tribe is mentioned as a mercantile tribe displaying maritime abilities. Could the lion and snake decorations refer to, referred to in the criticism of the rabbi from Mainz uh, only a few years earlier be related to this person, a man called Judah, and described as hailing from the mercantile background? Was Mr. Judah, or Mar Judah, the powerful lay leader from Cologne, attempting to subtly reference himself in the synagogue decorations, a place he may have thought of as his own court where he was dispensing justice? Were, the commission, were they commissioned by him or at his behest? Was this another reason for the ire of the rabbi from Mainz as it, is demonstrated, at his, as it demonstrated the strength of a lay leader in the Cologne rather than the religious leadership? <clears throat> Was the rabbi concerned both with a possible violation of the second commandment in the Decalogue and with the fact that there is also too closely resembling the Christian patrons of art in churches referencing themselves? The 1096 riots left a deep scar all over Rhineland Jews, and Cologne Jews were no exception. During the 12th century, however, the community slowly recuperated and recovered from the tragedy. Life began returning to normal, and the city's Jewish population grew and became more demographically homogenized with other Rhinish communities, and the rabbinic foothold in town grew in turn. We still, however, do not hear of a yeshiva. Those Jews in the city who sought to dedicate their lives to learning either turned to, a Talmudic, to the Talmudic academies of the Tosafists in northern France, or traveled up the river to the Middle Rhine academies of Mainz, Worms, and Speyer. It seems that the lay leadership in Cologne even in the 12th century, still called the shots. Cologne did, however, have a few of its own rabbinic scholars. Mid-12th century, Rabbi Yoel Halevi and his son, the early 13th century, Rabbi Eliezer ben Yoel Halevi, who is also known for his book, Avia Ezri, or Ravia, referred to Cologne in their writing, though they are said to have resided both in Cologne and in Bonn. Another native of Cologne, who eventually became an acclaimed rabbinic figure, was the 13th century Rabbi Asher ben Yechiel, known by his acronym Rosh. Born in Cologne in the mid-13th century, Asher traveled to Worms and to Rotenburg ab der Tauber to study with the great Talmud scholars of his time. He then returned to Cologne and married, living in the city till 1281. Asher's name, as well as his sister Efrat and his wife Yuta, 
also appear in the Juden Schreinsbuch. This source of information, unique to Cologne, was a ledger dating back to 1135, the first half of the 12th century, <clears throat> which was kept in the parish of the Church of St. Lawrence in Cologne. The Cologne Jewish Quarter was located in the jurisdiction of this parish, and the officials of the parish recorded every sale of real estate in the parish, becoming the trusted registrar for recording real estate transactions even among the Jews. In some cases, the ledger entry in Latin is paired by a matching Hebrew document, sewed into the ledger, recording the deeds of sale, the name of the buyers, sellers, witnesses to the sale, and the exact location of the assets sold and bought. The Hebrew deeds were signed by all parties involved, as well as the Jewish community lay officials known as Kahal Kolonia. You can see the right in the middle of the document before the names of people sig uh, in the signatures, it says Kahal Kolonia in Hebrew. Asher appears in this ledger as both an owner of property and as someone who sold their property when he left the city permanently in 1181. And this is uh, a part of the um, edition from 1888 that transcribed the entire ledger. As luck would have it, some of Asher's correspondence after he returned to Cologne in the late 1260s and before he left back to Worms in 1281 partially survived, including correspondence with his mentor, Rabbi Mayer of Rothenburg. These letters disclose some of the issues and clashes Asher had with the native community of Cologne. Let us briefly look at one example. This is a response by Mayer to a question raised by his Cologne-based younger disciple, Asher, regarding a point of contention between the Shum-trained Asher and the leaders of his native community in Cologne. It seems that like the aforementioned Rabbi Eliakim of the late 11th century, Asher too was driven to protest over what he saw as a problematic use of art in the sacred space of the Cologne synagogue, believing that this undermined Jewish values and blurred the distinguishing markers of Jewish community vis-a-vis -vis their Christian neighbors. Asher wrote to Mayer, hoping Mayer would join him and bolster his position on this matter and join his clamor. Existing scholarship on this matter focused on Asher's concern regarding the illuminated communal books of prayer, known as machzorim, mentioned in the beginning of the response. It seemed that the lavishly decorated and illuminated books of communal prayer seemed to Asher as a possible violation of the second commandment from the Decalogue. However, putting the question in its correct historical context, namely the decade between 1270 and 1280, when Asher and Mayer needed to communicate through correspondence and couldn't actually talk to one another, as they were 300 kilometers apart, raises some questions about Asher's quarry and about Mayer's response. Illuminated machzorim were indeed a relative novelty in Ashkenaz of the 12, late 1260s and early 1270s. But the earliest dated example of this genre, in fact, is from 1258, almost 12 years earlier. So what took Asher so long to react? Furthermore, the illuminations in the Mahzorim were two-dimensional and thus not really a violation of the Second Commandment. I believe that a closer look at Rabbi Meir's response overlooked in scholarship till today and the archaeological finds from Cologne as well as specific illuminated Mahzor, a specific illuminated Mahzor from Cologne designed and commissioned in this exact period in the early 1270s all may provide an answer to all these questions. First, the Machsor. I believe that the Machsor at the center of this controversy was the Amsterdam Machsor. Be this beautiful artifact has no fixed date for its colophon uh, stating its provenance didn't survive, but paleographical, textual, and liturgical evidence firmly suggests that it was produced in, in the Cologne community with its specific rite of prayer and pew team in the early 1270s. If we read Mayer's response to Asher closely, we will see that Mayer did not spend much effort relating to the colored decorations in the Mahzor, but rather to the halachic attitude towards three-dimensional imageries. This clearly does not correspond with the two-dimensional color illuminations of the Mahzor. Luckily, we have some archaeological finds from Cologne that can help us understand this discrepancy. But a few words about the archaeological campaigns that uncovered the medieval Jewish community's past 
are therefore in place. Allied troops captured Cologne in March of 1945. Like many other German cities of that size, by the end of World War II, Cologne lay in ruins. The devastation brought about by the war is clearly visible in the aerial photos taken in those days. 85% of the city's Innenstadt, the inner city and historical center were damaged. During this period, right after the war, alongside the attempt to rebuild the city, the first attempt to conduct archeological excavations took place in Cologne. The key figure in these efforts was archeologist Otto Doppelfeld, which I can talk about him for an hour. He's an amazing, amazing figure. Um, who managed to see that the devastation brought about by the war also presented an unprecedented opportunity to look into the city's ancient past. By the mid-1950s, Doppelfeld was an acclaimed public figure in Cologne. It was then that he began working around Cologne's Rathaus, the city hall. Doppelfeld was mainly interested in significant Roman remains, specifically the Roman governor's palace, the Praetorium. The area which he was hoping to find, the Praetorium, served in medieval times as the heart of Cologne and was in fact the medieval Jewish quarter. The street right next to the Rathaus was called during the medieval and early modern period the Judengasse, the Jewish alley, the Jewish street, serving as a faint reminder of a once flourishing, affluent, and very well-connected Jewish community. Doppelfeld was also aware of the fact that the Rathaus Chapel, the City Hall Chapel, used up until the Second World War for marriage ceremonies was actually the same structure that served as the medieval Jewish synagogue. As in many other towns that expelled the Jews in the late medieval period, Jewish communal property, like the synagogue, was appropriated by the Cologne City Council when it expelled the Jews in 1424. In 1426, the building that was once the synagogue was converted into the city hall's chapel, symbolically named St. Mary of Jerusalem. Although slightly modified in the 19th century, it stood and was visible up until the turbulent times of the war. Anticipating the need to dig through the city's medieval Jewish monuments like the synagogue and revealing the medieval Jewish past en route to uncovering the Roman remains, Doppelfeld reached out to Dr. Rabbi Tzvi Azaria, otherwise also known as Hermann Helfgott. Oops, should back up. The guy on the right. Um, he was chief rabbi of Cologne in the mid-1950s. Doppelfeld correctly realized that without the involvement of an official Jewish representative, it would be difficult in post-war Western Germany to dig in a former Jewish site. Between 1955 and 1957, a team of German archaeologists led by Doppelfeld and closely followed by Helfgott Azaria unearthed some of the remains of the medieval Jewish quarter situated in the middle of the medieval city of Cologne near the synagogue and right next to the Rathaus. As in all archaeological digs, one should expect the unexpected. Underneath the synagogue floor, the team found what seemed like an empty subterranean uh, chamber or safe, or treasure room, that was situated right underneath the area of the magnificent Gothic-style limestone bima, with a staircase leading to it from the synagogue floor level. Doppelfeld also uncovered and cleaned a splendid 17-meter deep underground ritual bath mikvah, which can be seen on the invitation for today's lectures. This ritual bath fed from a subterranean stream flowing into its carefully masoned stone slab basin. At the beginning of, the ninth, of the, this century, the 21st century, a Cologne municipal archaeologist, Dr. Sven Schütte, managed to convince the city and state officials in Nordrhein-Westfalia uh, of the necessity of revisiting Otto Doppelfeld's excavations. Luckily, the area next to the Rathaus was left vacant and served for years as a parking lot. Schütte began digging in 2006, and the excavation lasted for much longer than he had planned, also depleting the budget. Um, he sorted through material that had not been processed in the 1950s and revealed new material. Going through the material, Schutte began finding astounding treasures. A 14th century golden ring, much like the ones you saw at the cloisters or are about to see in the cloisters. 
a chainmail armor suit, thousands of pieces of slate that served as roof tiles, among them several hundred damaged ones that functioned as material for writing drafts with Hebrew writing on them, burnt wooden beams, stone and other building material. Many of the remains were debris from the August 1349 Black Plague pogrom, during which the Jewish quarter was stormed and severely damaged by a rioting mob who killed many, much like what happened in Colmar. The debris were cleared by the city council in the 14th century, in the aftermath of the riot, and thrown into the basements of the homes of the Jewish quarter that was abandoned at the time. Some of this debris belonged to the synagogue, including floor tiles, benches that surrounded the structure, and thousands of small pieces of fine white northern French limestone. Among them, archaeologists found Gothic-style sculpture elements that were already identified by Doppelfeld as belonging to the Bima. A well, as well as pieces from the Ark, the Arun Kodesh. Using modern imaging technology, Schutte and his team managed to reconstruct the inside of the synagogue and the bima. Judging by the artistic style of the finds, Schutte concluded that the synagogue and the bima were renovated in the 1260s, late 1260s, early 1270s. The stonemason's markings on the larger fragments from the bima included, uh, indicated that they belonged to a professional mason's workshop located just a stone throw away, the ongoing building project of the local cathedral. The same masons worked on both projects. The Bima, or Almemor, was built of exclusive limestone imported from northern France and not from the local cheaper stone used in the cathedral, a testimony to the wealth and the power of the community. Of course, the two projects were not the same scale. The stonemasons who worked on the bima at the behest of the Cologne community leadership included a long sign beautiful reliefs of flora and raspberry and acanthus leaves, also stone reliefs of various animals such as birds of prey, dogs, and even figures that appear to present a mystical crossbreeding of human and animal. The archaeological findings and their analysis indicate that the bima was vibrantly and artistically colored, bringing the stone reliefs to life. The splendid bima was shattered in 1349 during the pogrom and whose remains were found in the excavation, dating to the late 60s and early 70s, the same time frame as the commissioning of the Amsterdam Machsor and the question by Rabbi Asher and Rabbi Meir's response. These findings allow us to better understand what Rabbi Asher was troubled by and why Meir discuss the three-dimensional imagery in his response. The convergence of a lavishly illuminated machsor and the renovation of the magnificent limestone bima with a host of animal and demi-human reliefs carved in stone and lavishly colored at the focal point of the cultic activities in the synagogue was what, was, was what so troubled Rabbi Asher. His concerns were, in fact, very similar to the concerns raised by Rabbi Eliakim of Mainz almost two centuries earlier. Asher's question and Mayer's response reveal the tension between the halachists with their high level of theological sensitivity and the lay leaders of the Cologne community, who apparently did not share the rabbinical angst of these matters. Although Mayer seems to have shared Asher's concern, he signals in his response that the chances that things can be undone are slim. The older Mayer chose, as in other matters raised by Asher in those years, not to be vitriolic about these matters and avoid direct confrontation with the Cologne Jewish community lay leadership. From their point of view, the communal lay leaders wished to project the power and strength of their community by beautifying and decorating the ritual space and ritual objects, like the machsor, and the role they themselves played in this process with which they undertook at significant financial costs. It is likely that it was also the high correlation of similar phenomena that took place in the surrounding Christian society that was again at the basis of the rabbinic criticism exhibited in Asher's question and his position that these actions were problematic from a theological perspective. There is much more to be said about the Cologne community and more questions to be asked. Was Cologne indeed a more ancient community with other ideas about how to handle matters of Jewish identity? Was the fact that it was under less rabbinic influence the reason for some of its different traditions and attitudes towards the use of art in the synagogue? Are these two matters connected? All these are questions that should be further investigated. In sum, I hope that I've managed to give you a glimpse 
into how we must put together this puzzle piece by piece in order to get somewhat understandable picture of life in a medieval Jewish cologne. It is only by combining all of our different sources, medieval Jewish internal discussions in thick halachic discourse, material from the surrounding Christian society, a liturgical decorated object like the machzor, and finds from the archaeological excavations that we are able to create a more nuanced picture of Jewish life in one of medieval Germany's most intriguing cities, Cologne. Thank you very much. I'm going to do a little hmm, sniff. Let's see. There we go. Um, there we go. And, uh, right? Okay. Our second speaker this evening is Barbara Drake Bame, the Paul and Jill Ruddock Senior Curator for the Met Cloisters and the woman behind the fabulous Colmar Treasure Show at the Cloisters that's been mentioned now um, several times, um, and that was the inspiration for us tonight. So um, just so you're aware, this is not the first time Barbara has cast her judicious eye on objects that speak to the dynamics of urban life in the medieval period. Indeed, you're probably all aware of the fabulous exhibition that Barbara co-curated Jerusalem 1000 to 1400, Every People Under Heaven, that was at the Met beginning in 2016. And it's worth mentioning also that the catalog for that show won the Alfred H. Barr Jr. Award from the College Art Association, which is the most prestigious honor in the field. Before that, Barbara curated a wonderful show, the wonderful show called Prague, The Crown of Bohemia, another blockbuster at the Met in 2005, and one that also dealt with the Jewish community in that city. So I think we have a lot we want to hear from Barbara, and so without further delay, I'll introduce Barbara Bain. Um, so thank you, Nina. Um, I'm actually thrilled that this, that this little exhibition should have uh, occasioned such a wonderful paper as we just had and that I think we will have after this as well. Um, I don't really have enough room, so I'm going to just move these guys. Um, after speaking to Nina, um, I wanted to do something a little bit more informal and to try to let you know kind of what's beh what was behind our thinking in bringing the Colmar treasure to New York. And it's a, it's a fairly simple story, but I think it's, it's one that uh, bears this kind of explanation. So this is the cover of the, of the small publication that we did um, for the occasion for, with Scala Publishers, which I'm very happy about, though I have to say that looking at this morning, I found a mistake I made, and it's killing me. <laughs> but be that as it may. Um, so, so why this exhibition at the Cloisters? Uh, we try to do an exhibition one, about once a year at the Cloisters, and our goal is to try to tell a story that we otherwise haven't told with our, with our extraordinarily wonderful collection. But when you approach the Cloisters as visitors, whether you come once or repeatedly, uh, the very architecture of the building sings out to you, you know, king, castle, bishop, cathedral, abbot, monastery. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly uh, strong assertion, uh, an avowedly Christian world that it, that it conjures up because after all, the Cloisters is, at the end of the day, a confection. It's the architect of the Cloisters was the architect of Riverside Church, the patron of the Cloisters was John D. Rockefeller Jr., himself the king and heir of Standard Oil, uh, steeped in the notion of the Protestant ethic. And when the building opened in 1938, if you were to look at what was said at the opening of the museum at the time, uh, there's a vague mention, uh, which everyone cites, but which is really not that strong, about the educational mission of the cloisters. But really, what 
Rockefeller was obsessed with was the fact that there were new laws going into effect about people, workers, actually being allowed to have time off. And he's very concerned about the profitable use of leisure. And they were terrified that the masses were going to drink themselves into um, oblivion. And so they needed something good and cultural to, to do with their time. It was May of 1938. Hitler had been chancellor for five years. You would think that at the opening of a museum that is dedicated to European culture, it's only six months before Kristallnacht, that somebody would have mentioned the dark clouds over Europe, not a bit of it, not a bit of it. It was all about what, what are we gonna do with these people who have all this free time now, right? And so it was maybe important for them, at least from Rockefeller's point of view, and certainly from the cultural point of view, to understand the, that great European world of the past. And so if you come, in, once you come inside the cloisters, that message is repeated to you. You see King Arthur. Yes, we have David and Joshua too, but seen through a Christian lens. And occasionally we have some women like the Duchess of Berry in prayer. If you go into our Gothic chapel, you can see what Christian burial is about. And you can see stained glass from the chapel of a nobleman from the court circles just outside Vienna. Now, some of these objects, like the King Arthur, was acquired in time for the opening of the cloisters. The Duke of Berry's manuscript, not until the 1950s the Ebrichsdorf glass until 1982. And so very consistently throughout our amazing collection, there is a reinforced message about the power of Christianity, about the power of the church, about the power of the prince. And this was, to my mind, actually aggravated a couple of years ago when the Met rebranded itself in red and white, as if that was a new thing. My husband's construction firm has used red and white forever. But we now have red and white, which gave us two big banners hanging from the cloisters. And when I said to the designers, don't you think it's a little problematic? What do you mean? Don't they kind of remind you of the Nuremberg banners? They had no idea what I was talking about. I'm still working on trying to get rid of those banners in front of the cloisters. The Cloisters has a sister institution, and that is the Musée de Cluny in Paris. And it has some similarities to our collection. Whereas we evoke a kind of the Romanesque world, they have an authentic Gothic structure built for the um, abbot of Cluny, Jacques d'Amboise in 1485, early 1500s. Um, it opened as a museum in 1843, so just shy of 100 years before the cloisters. And it, has, it had already, by the late 1880s, 10,000 objects in its collection. So they were 100 years ahead of us in opening, but in many ways, or at least in one very important way to my mind, they were way ahead of us. Because in 1890, the Baroness Nathan of uh, de Rochelle donated to the Musée de Cluny a substantial collection of Judaica from the Isaac Strauss collection, uh, which includes this uh, 17th century menorah uh, by Johann Michael Scheuler. So not everything is medieval by any long shot, but there was an understanding at that early date that central to the mission of the Musée de Cluny should also be the presentation of of Jewish cultural and artistic heritage. You may not have realized that that was part of the Musée de Cluny collection because in the 1980s, um, all of that collection, with one exception, was moved to the Hotel de Saint-Aignan in the Marais, which had been the, not the medieval uh, Jewish neighborhood, but the sort of since the 18th century. And that is now its own uh, Jewish museum in the city of Paris. But the core of that collection, comes from, um, from this collection that was acquired for the Musée de Cluny. The Isaac Strauss collection had been shown at the Exposition Universelle in Paris in the 1870s, and then in the Anglo-Jewish uh, historical exhibition in London too, so it was quite celebrated material. And then uh, it also, the museum also includes this amazing set of uh, funeral slabs uh, which were excavated in the mid-19th century. So when my dear colleague, who um, 
I can hardly bear to say that she's just decided to take an early retirement. I can hardly bear to say it, but I have to. Uh, Elisabeth Delay said to me that um, they were going to be closing the Musée de Cluny for a time for renovations. What would I like to borrow for the cloisters? And I said, I'd like to borrow the Colmar treasure. And she looked at me a little bit surprised. Now, you know, the Colmar treasure includes some, eh, little slightly funky silver rings and a silver ring um, with a piece of glass and such a lovely object as a gilded copper slightly um, damaged hinge. I think she was pretty sure that I was going to ask for the Basel altar or the Avignon rose, but no, I asked for to borrow the Colmar treasure and she seemed a bit surprised by that, but um, shouldn't have been because the Colmar treasure, although not the largest or most imposing thing in the collection of the Musée de Cluny, has an, an astounding historical importance. And I think that the reason that the collection, uh, the treasure itself was acquired by the Musée de Cluny was to build on this collection of Judaica that had been established at the beginning um, of the, tw uh, at the late 19th century. So uh, the connection of the treasure to medieval Jewish heritage really happened, as far as we know, only at the time of the acquisition of the treasure by the Musée de Cluny, when we have this early photograph, of which I show you a detail, of one of the rings which bears a tag alerting us that it is, in fact, a Jewish wedding ring. The history of the collection and its importance was ignored for quite a long time and um, for various complicated reasons. It was found in the 1860s in, pri in, in a private residence. It remained in private hands until the 1920s when it was purchased by the Musée de Cluny and then subsequently um, didn't get any attention because of the war and then didn't get any attention because of um, the involvement of a gentleman called Victor Klagsbald, who knew a lot about Judaica and not a lot about medieval goldsmith's work, uh, um, and who, upon seeing the ring, which he recognized, of course, as being um, of Jewish heritage, it says Mazel Tov across the top, for goodness sakes, um, but he thought that it was 16th century and therefore disassociated it from the rest of the treasure. And so for a period of time, uh, there was no connection, the, the connection was separated, and it was only when my colleagues, uh, who are experts in French goldsmith's work, worked on the uh, treasure that they realized that they did, in fact, belong together. So I've given you a hint of why uh, this seemed important to me for the cloisters, to give a bigger picture of what the medieval world was about. And, and I want to just emphasize that this is not uh, a new of course, a new idea for me or even for the Met. Um, certainly for my own involvement at the Met, as Nina mentioned, my interest in the medieval Jewish heritage traces uh, as to the, to the Prague exhibition, which was in a thousand years ago in 2005. Um, and, and I want to use this moment to say that, um, to give a shout out to someone who was really f a mentor for me in this realm, and that's Vivian Mann, um, who died this year. She did a wonderful essay for us at the time of the Prague exhibition about uh, the Jewish community of Prague at the time. Uh, and she subsequently led um, a program for museum curators in other fields uh, to learn about Jewish artistic heritage. And that was a program in the Institute for Jewish Studies that was run uh, through the Jewish Theological Seminary that um, I and my colleague Melanie Holcomb did, did with Vivian. So, of course, for those of you who've been to Prague, there's this magnificent mid-13th century synagogue with the very confusing name of the Alt Neu Schul. We won't get into its confusing name, but suffice it to say that it's because Prague enjoyed over the course of the medieval period, not one, not two, not three, but four different synagogues that met different fates, but this one um, almost miraculously and rather through rather perverse moments in its history has, has survived. Um, but it's very, it's, of course it's quite exceptional for, for that to happen. Much more common is a circumstance that we see in Regensburg, uh, where the synagogue is lost and known to us through the uh, etchings by Altdorfer, which were done in 1519, you know, really on the eve of the ov almost overnight destruction of that synagogue. And um, 
only the vaguest hint that something might have been there. You, you wouldn't know the Frauenkir from the Frauenkirche in Nuremberg, which stands on top of the destroyed synagogue. But, and what about Colmar? If you look at Sebastian Munster's uh, 1575 image of the city of Colmar, you will sense absolutely no Jewish presence whatsoever because it's gone. And curiously at the time, and perhaps not so curiously, even in a city like Prague, where there was still a very prominent, and still is today, the very prominent synagogue, if you look at Johannes Vector's Prague panorama of 1606, you would have no idea that there was anyone Jewish in town, even though that monument remains. So you can be forgiven if what you might know of Colmar is the Isenheim altar of 1512 to 16 and the Musée d'Unterland, and the main reason that people go to visit Colmar, or even Disney's Beauty and the Beast, inspired by the Alsatian villages, right? But there was a much more to the story of the city than Belle and the lecherous Gaston, or even of the magnificent Isenheim altar. The story of Prague Jewry is not entirely lost, and we should have been aware of it since the time of the 1863 discovery of the treasury in a confectioner's shop um, in the city of Colmar. This was a great confectioner. They didn't just make macaron. Their specialty was rather these uh, rather strong um, spirits made from pear or apple in the Alsatian region. And so when they were um, renovating that building, which is now a hotel, which you see there, um, they stumbled on the treasure in the mortar of the wall. In addition to the kind of funky silver pieces I showed you before, of course there are these magnificent um, gold pieces. And if you come to see the exhibition, I have some thoughts about what distinguishes the, those earlier silver pieces and the, um, the later 14th century pieces in the collection and what that might tell us about the ownership of this treasure. Now, the treasure has been shown before and I wanted to present it in a way that's distinct from the way we've understood it up to now. Not distinct, but complementary in that builds out from that. In 2007, the treasure was shown as part of an exhibition uh, called Trésor de la Peste Noire when it was shown in Paris, Treasures of the Black Death when it was subsequently shown in London. And that exhibition focused on both the treasure from Comar and the uh, uh, contemporary treasure found much more recently at the end of the 20th century in Erfurt. Both of those are treasures that are consist of works of art, mostly goldsmith work, that, um, that were, if not hidden in 1349, lost in 1349 when the Jewish communities of the Rhineland especially, but not uniquely, um, were uh, scapegoated at the outbreak of the Black Death and put to death, right? And this happened up and down the Rhineland, and you see that illustrated in an, uh, in an illumination on the left, which is a Christian history that tells the story. I, I didn't want to give the story either to the destruction, to the death of the community, nor to the destruction by the Black Death. I felt very strongly that if I did that, 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 that they had no story, that in fact the community had been erased. And so, and also that there can be on the part of people a kind of ghoulish fascination with the Black Death, with the murder of Jews, with the suffering of people, and I I wanted to realign it. I wanted both to acknowledge the terrible thing that happened, but also to give these people a place back in the history. I realize that this is a very delicate balancing act. But instead of calling it Treasures of the Black Death, I wanted to call this treasure the legacy of that Jewish community, a medieval Jewish legacy. Because what makes this material a treasure? You can have a lot bigger treasures. There are a lot bigger treasures, even in the Met. 
It's not about the cumulative weight of the silver or the gold. It's about what these objects tell us about these people, or what it tries to tell us about these people. And it's the only voice that they have. I think in all of this, I was on some level affected by 9-11 by the biographies that appear day after day in the New York Times, bringing individuals to life. If you just say there's X number of thousands of people who died, you lose them. You don't know who they are. They are absolutely faceless. I can't, I have no photographs. We, this is not, right, we're dealing with things that are from um, half a, more than half a millennium ago. But what could we do to try to tease out a story from these people. I think to some extent, I was certainly, my idea of a presenting it in this way was then reinforced by the shooting last year in Pittsburgh. The exhibition was well on its way, but when that happened, I felt again that this, the personalizing of the story of the community was important. I wanted it to be that when you look, or when you visit this fairy tale town, that Jewish community is there. I wanted to put them back there. I also wanted to say something about how they perceived their world and how we might not be broad enough in our perception of their world. They built a synagogue, it burned down. They built a new synagogue within a 20 to 30 year period. They had a mikveh, they had a school. They had, as we've come to see, or, and. Judith Kogel will talk about this at the Cloisters on Sunday. They had an extraordinary library. It was a learned learning community. And they, they, were, they were putting down roots in Colmar. They had only arrived in the 13th century. There was no Jewish community in Colmar at the time of the First Crusade. They had business dealings with their Christian neighbors. They lived next door to their Christian neighbors. And they had a, a bright outlook about their lives there. And so, just a hint of that hopefulness is unexpectedly in this tiny little ring, which might surprise you. It has a star and a crescent on it. So when you look at it, you think, wait a minute, that's like the flag of Tunisia. That is the flag of Tunisia, right? Um, we associate that star and crescent with the Islamic world today. But in the medieval Jewish world, that was emblematic of the month of Nisan which you see in this manuscript from the Jewish Theological Seminary. And here it is again on a ring from the Erfurt treasure. And it also, also shows up on um, seal matrices of the Jewish, medieval Jewish community. It was an emblem about deliverance and about renewal for the people of Israel. And that, to me, seeing a thing like this in the context of a community that within 20 or 30 years is going to be utterly lost, increases the poignancy of that loss by emphasizing what their thinking had been at the moment. Um, there are two objects, uh, additional objects, that have, in one case, uh, that have been suggested to have connections specifically with the practice of Judaism uh, at the time and the life of Jews at the time. One is this little silver key. Uh, and this was recently suggested by some French colleagues, so it is, in a very observant practice, you are not to, in the same way that you're not to punch an elevator button on the Sabbath, um, you are not to carry your household key when you leave home to go to the synagogue. And what do you do, therefore, with your valuables and how do you protect them in your absence? So they, um, they came up with a solution, let's call it, to that challenge, um, which was discussed in rabbinical circles at the time, and that was that you could put all of your keys, lock everything, and put all of your keys in a box at home, and then lock that box with a precious key, which then when you wore that key became like an article of jewelry and therefore okay for you to go out. And if they're, if they're right, the scholars who have suggested this, then that little key in the Colmar treasure would be the first, the earliest instance of that to survive, which I, again, think has a very um, special quality to it. And in the treasure, I, I should say there are um, 300 coins, all of them silver but one, 300 and change. 
no pun intended. Um, and the one gold coin is a gold florin. And I happened upon the information that um, at, at just around this time in the 1330s, um, the Holy Roman Emperor, um, well, he was like a mafia boss in his relationship to the Jews. He, you know, he, 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 he extorted them for money, right? So because they were under his protection, they had to pay, those Jews who had a sufficient, certain level of means, had to pay annually one gold florin to the imperial treasury. And I have suggested in the context of our exhibition that, in fact, this one gold florin in the midst of all these silver coins might have been the one, might have been the tax for that year that that family had set aside already. The heritage of learning uh, among the Colmar Jews is, is something that's new. We thought that it was only their, um, this one cache of jewelry that represented them, but in fact, uh, some bits and pieces of the Hebrew manuscripts from the community have been worked into the bindings of later Christian printed books. They, they provide the cushion uh, for the binding. This, it's, not a, um, it's not an unusual practice. It's actually quite a common practice, whether they're earlier Christian manuscripts or whatever you might have in terms of leftover disused parchment then gets incorporated. But in this case, um, these were manuscripts that had passed into the hands of the Christian communities after the Black Death, and then have subsequently been discovered and reconstructed, and that's how we know about their learning. But I wanted people also to know about the everyday lives of this community. And one of the least imposing pieces in the collection is this little silver, it's not much bigger than a toothpick. And my colleague in Paris kept saying, you, you want to borrow everything from the treasure? Yes, I want to borrow everything from the treasure. So what is the point of that little silver toothpick-like thing. Well, when you just see it on its own, it, it, it has no meaning. It does, tells you nothing. But for you know, nerdy medievalists like me, you know that that goes with an ensemble like this. It's the only one that survives with its whole ensemble, right? It's a little ivory booklet plus the little silver pen plus the little case that it goes into. And the notion is that on the back of those ivory tablets, it's, it has a little depression and you can put some wax in there and then you can write a note to your lover and you know that from what's on the front and then you pass the notes just like junior high and then instead of being like text messaging, right? It's, it is sort of medieval, well, it's really medieval sexting probably. Um, and then it gets erased, right? That's the better thing. It's not out there in cyberspace for somebody else to find and get, right? It's right there. So again, this little, this tiny little unassuming thing in the treasure, which we then showed with a piece from our collection, which doesn't have its pen, right? Um, suddenly allows these people, again, oh, they had love lives too, right? They have ceremonial wedding rings, they have love lives. And, and so these pieces from our own collection serve to anchor, you know, at least that's our hope, to anchor these isolated bits and pieces that have survived from the, from the treasure. I, I want to return a little bit to that, to that question of the delicate balance because when you talk about this period and how these things came down to us and the death of this Jewish community, we touch nerves. We touch nerves across centuries. But we have no choice. We can ignore their story or we can present it as best we can. We can choose only to talk about their deaths or we can rather try to bring them out of obscurity. The estimate is that it was about 5% of the population. That's something like 60 to 70 people uh, uh, out of the population in the 1270s. So I just want to end by reading with you what we said on our label when you come in to try to, to, try to hit that balance. The tale told in this exhibition begins with hidden treasure uncovered in 1863 in Colmar, a city by the Rhine River in modern day France. While renovating a, a confectionery shop on the Rue des Juifs, Street of the Jews, in this town of storybook charm, 
workmen stumbled upon a cache of medieval jewels and coins. At the heart of this small treasure lies a rare 14th century Jewish wedding ring, its gold letters spelling Mazel Tov, good luck. Colmar's Jewish citizens were mostly recent immigrants who had found sanctuary in the city, then part of the Holy Roman Empire. The newcomers lived alongside their Christian neighbors and flourished as merchants while Colmar's celebrated wine industry grew. And if you want to know about, more about that, come on Sunday to the cloisters. Confident in the future, they built a synagogue, a mikvah for ritual bathing, and a school. When the plague struck in 1348 to 49, panic and prejudice created a toxic brew, with townspeople all along the Rhine accusing Jews of poisoning the wells. The Pope's defense of the Jews fell on deaf ears, and when the emperor failed to assert the rule of law, Colmar burned its Jewish citizens to death. Following the massacre, the emperor laid claim to important Jewish assets. The rest faded into the municipal landscape. The Colmar treasure, tucked away for safekeeping, passed unnoticed. Centuries later, the treasure in the collection of the Musée de Cluny since 1923 imposes a special burden on us to tell the tragic tale that hatred can write and to attest to precious lives lived and lost. Um, I hope if you haven't seen the exhibition that you will come see it. And um, thank you very much. Okay, our final speaker this evening here Our final speaker this evening is Deborah Kaplan. Deborah is a senior lecturer at the Department of Jewish History at Bar Ilan University, and before that, she was associate professor at Yeshiva University here in New York. Deborah is the author of Beyond Expulsion, Jews, Christians, and Reformation Strasbourg, which is, is published in 2011, and it was the winner of the Bernadotte Schmidt Research Prize and recently was translated into Hebrew. Deborah's second book is forthcoming from University of Pennsylvania Press, and it is titled The Patrons and Their Poor, Jewish Community and Public Charity in Early Modern Germany. Among the many awards she has earned is a recent fellowship from the Israel Institute for Advanced Studies and, which is especially interesting for us tonight, a four-year grant from the Israel Science Foundation for a project, a project called Mapping Daily Life in Early Modern Ashkenaz. Please join me in welcoming Deborah Kaplan. Thank you all very much. Uh, thanks to Nina and to Magda to inviting me. It's always a pleasure for me to be in the Center for Jewish Studies at Fordham, and it's always a homecoming for me to come back to my native New York. I want to start off on a personal note and say that this particular evening and exhibition and theme feels like a personal homecoming um, in many ways. One of my earl earliest childhood memories, I direct this to you, is going to the cloisters as a little girl. Um, I just loved it, as you can see by what I did with my life. And um, it was amazing. And the first time I saw the treasure of Colmar was in Colmar when it was at the Musée d'Interlinden about 18 or 19 years ago. And to now see it in this context of bringing the daily lives of Jews in Alsace to life, which is very much what I've been doing for a long time, um, it's just very exciting. So it's really, really a wonderful evening, and I'm very, very honored to be a part of it. So what I'd like to start with um, is changing the setting just a little bit, going just north of Colmar, uh, south of Cologne, and um, subject of my talk this evening is the city of Strasbourg. And I'm also going to give sort of an epilogue to what we've heard so far, moving our conversation from the 14th century into the 16th and even slightly into the 17th century. So let's begin uh, with the city of Strasbourg, or the city of Strasbourg. This is a map from 1548, but it will um, do for us this building without the roof right here. 
That's the cathedral. The artist actually sat on the cathedral roof when he drew the map and forgot to draw what he was leaning against. But just imagine a tall spire over there. Like the other medieval communities that we heard about this evening, including those of the Shum communities and Colmar and also Cologne, uh, the Jewish community of Strasbourg had many communal institutions, probably two synagogues, a ritual bath, and also a cemetery. And if you see the cathedral, the Judengasse, the Jewish street, was located right next to the cathedral, which was common in most of the European uh, Jewish communities, certainly those discussed here this evening, during the Middle Ages. We're talking about a community of probably uh, 200 people, perhaps a bit more, we don't have exact numbers, so bigger than that of Colmar, and slightly older as well. We have evidence of Jews living there already in the 12th century uh, from, from tombstones and some other uh, rabbinic texts, which Effie has actually worked on. And because of the spatial layout of this Jewish community, we can assume that just as we heard in the previous talks tonight, the medieval Jews and Christians interacted with one another on a daily basis in a very simple manner. If when I live on the Judengasse and I open up my window, I'm looking at a cathedral, I know what's on the cathedral. And I see my neighbors who are Christians. And I am well aware through the sounds and the sights and the smells and the holidays and the conversation with my neighbors of what's going on. And vice versa is also uh, the case. So we're talking about a community that is, I don't know if I want to use the word integrated, but somewhat uh, connected, certainly very much a part of the medieval landscape. Now this changes rather dramatically, as we've heard in all the presentations this evening, in the year 1349. And unlike some of these other locations, the plague, the Black Death, actually does not hit Strasbourg at all. But rather, when the city's burghers here that the plague has struck Basel and other cities to the south. They get worried and they say, let's expel the Jews. And uh, it's a very dramatic moment. The city's mayor does not want to expel the Jews. The burghers expel the city mayor. And ultimately what they do is also um, a, a sad massacre six months before that of Cologne in February 1349, right around the time of Colmar. Uh, we basically have a massacre of the Jews, most of them burned by fire, some baptized, all the loans um, which were owed to Jews annulled. And the Jewish community of Strasbourg, though not as famous as that of Cologne or Speyer, Worms or Mainz, is essentially expelled. This is not the complete end of the Jewish community, but as I said, it's a moment where everything is changed. I want to just really highlight this point, which is sort of the backdrop for my entire approach this evening. Uh, first, I want to explain what I mean by that, by what changes. Jews actually do come back to the city of Strasbourg in the 1360s, but instead of 200 Jews or several hundred Jews, let's say two, 300 Jews, we have six Jewish families. So if you think about the numbers, the presence, it's a completely different experience. We're talking about maybe 10 to 15 people, maybe 20 people. We don't know how many children they have because the lists don't include children. But we're talking about, let's say, 25 people at max instead of 200. So a tiny, tiny community. And it doesn't return to its city center. Rather, they live on the outskirts of the city. And this is a very fleeting Jewish community. Essentially, by 1390, there are ups, there are downs, there are different expulsions and privileges. But if you look at an outline, what had been a very important Jewish community for about at least 150, 200 years, ends in 1349, a few Jewish families are readmitted, and then just 20 to 30 years later, certainly by 1390 to 91, all of the Jews are expelled in Strasbourg. And when I say expelled, they can't live there, they don't come back there, and no Jews are allowed to live in the city until 1791, when in the wake of the French Revolution, the Ashkenazic Jews receive emancipation, and the Jews who live in the countryside in Alsace, and I'll talk about them in a moment, are allowed to enter the city. So essentially, we have a city in which Jews cannot live for 400 years, from 1390 until 1791. It's not just a reality on the ground that we have a city without any Jews, but this actually becomes a trope. It becomes something that Strasbourg is famous for, even as far away as Poland. And I'm just going to bring one example, though I could bring more than one. I'm going to bring an example of one of the most famous Christian humanists of the Renaissance, Jakob Wimfeling, who lived in Strasbourg and wrote, describing his city, 
And it's very, I'm not going to read the whole quote, but you're welcome to. I'll start at the beginning. He's describing his native town and what makes it better than any other place. In these things, our city is seen as greatly superior and more complete than other cities, with churches, chapels, relics, hospitals, convents, with a decorated cathedral, with an Episcopal see, libraries of books, men who are learned in all the arts, with schools of the mendicant orders, architects, the expulsion of the Jews, delightful buildings, beautiful streets and areas, with ramparts, trenches, towers, and anyone who's been to Strasbourg knows it's beautiful. And it had no Jews. And this was seen as part of the scape, the absence of the Jews. It was something for which the city could be praised. It's remarkable. It's also many years after the expulsion. He's writing this in the 15th century. The Jews were expelled in 1390. So it's still a big deal. It's talked about. It's valorized. It's thought about as a plus. Come see Strasbourg, the city without Jews and beautiful pink ramparts. And so I really want to highlight this. Strasbourg is the city without Jews par excellence. And indeed, they don't live there. Where do they go? Let's look at the map. You see I've put Strasbourg in the um, red rectangle. And if you look here, you have Colmar, just to sort of situate us. All of these little towns, other than Celesta, which is here, which is a city which also doesn't have Jews, and I'll speak more about that in the cloisters on Sunday. All of these other towns and villages are tiny towns and villages, some really about the size of the campus that we're on right now. And in these small villages and towns, I found the presence of Jews. And this is where many of them went. While some may have migrated elsewhere, further east, like many Jews do, some Jews just moved to the countryside. And this becomes the norm in Alsace, and really until the 20th century, some of these towns boasted of Jewish populations. However, in this period, post-expulsion from 1349 till about 1648 or even 1700, we're talking about a, quanti a qualitatively different Jewish life, where instead of having your synagogue and your cemetery and your ritual bath all on one street near the cathedral, you have one Jewish family, you have three Jewish families, you have five Jewish families, Perhaps you have a whopping 11 Jewish families. And this, I won't be able to go into it tonight, really leads to a different kind of Jewish observance. These are observant Jews, but they don't have the same communal institutions, and their Jewish communal life and organization is different than it had been before. So Jewish life changes. But my topic for this evening is not that huge change that the community underwent. And they did see themselves, though living in all these small towns and villages, as one Alsatian Jewish community. But I'd like to look at something different. What I'd like to focus on today is the city of Strasbourg itself, and to say that even in this city that apparently has no Jews for 400 years and is very proud of that fact, there is still a Jewish presence. And when you go into the archives, like I did, they preserve a record of Jews entering the city on a daily basis during that time. And that's the story that I would like to tell this evening. This evening, I would like to talk about the period after the expulsion, primarily the period of the 16th century, just because that's really interesting. And um, I'm going to look at three different examples of Jewish-Christian relations in this city without Jews. First, economic and legal context between Jews and Christians. Second, the teaching of Hebrew and Judaism to Protestant reformers. And third, personal relationships between Jews and Christians. So, I'd like to, there we go. I'd like to start with economic context. The main reason that Jews entered the city of Strasbourg on a daily basis was, of course, not to live there, but was to do business there. And this was something that was beneficial to the Jews who needed to make a living. Many of them were money lenders. And the larger marketplace of the city was the attractive place for them to work rather than a small village. But it was also essential to the functioning of the urban economy of Strasbourg because we're in the period before banks and you need to borrow money in order to make the economy work in the big marketplace. And so what we have are Jews coming into the city on a daily basis and working in the city's markets and leaving the city every evening. A bell was sounded and the Jews would leave the city at the time of that ringing. Now, what's very interesting, this is, this is the case in many Jewish uh, communities in cities from which Jews had been expelled. Strasbourg is not, as we heard this evening, the only city in which this happened. And Jews entered other cities, such as Colmar, 
uh, on a daily basis as well. And you can see very similar things. But one of the things that makes Strasbourg unique is that in Strasbourg there was a formal contract drawn up by the Jews of those various villages that we just saw and the city magistrates, the government of the city, laying out the terms for their relationship, talking about the, le- the rate of money lending and how much interest could be charged. And most of all, and this is what was essential to Strasbourg city government, how disputes between Jews and Christians would be adjudicated. And most of the contract deals with those terms. The question of what happens when you have a loan and somebody doesn't pay it back, and there's a dispute. And for the Strasbourg magistrates, it was essential that the Jews would come and bring their court cases to the local court in Strasbourg. And indeed, when we look at the legal documents from the archives, we can see many, many examples of court cases brought by Jews or Christians dealing with their interactions with one another, sometimes even referring to this contract saying, according to the contract, this rate is too high. According to the contract, he sued me in the wrong court. And we see this this was applied in practice, and it was a very organized agreement, which is in some ways you know, very paradoxical. Because on the one hand, you have a city magistrate saying, we absolutely do not want Jews here. And on the other hand, they say, so when you come in, here are the terms for litigating your presence, and we definitely want you in our local courts. And so we see the Jews there all the time. And there's a familiarity and even an intimacy between the Jews and the Christians both the Jews and their Christian customers, because what we see is repeat cases with the same lender, the same family of lenders, and the same Christians, so they always use the same money lender. And we also see an intimacy between some of the Jews and the Christian magistrates. So for example, uh, one of my favorite examples is when a Jew writes to the magistrate saying, you've summoned me to a court hearing on Saturday. But you know, this is the Jewish Sabbath, and I can't travel. So can I please have an adjournment? And they say, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. That's not an issue. You can have an adjournment. Or saying, you know me really well. My mother is sick. She can't come to court. Would you like me to come in her place? And they say, well, that's okay. When she gets better, she can come herself. So there's a dialogue that really develops between Jews and Christians. And what the records don't preserve, but what we can sort of imagine if we just stretch a little bit beyond the sources, is if you have people interacting with one another every day and you have this kind of familiarity with the legal system and with the city administrators, what kinds of conversations they may have had, what kinds of social relationships they may have developed. And those, of course, would not be preserved in the kinds of documents we have, legal contracts, court cases, but these were people who knew one another and very likely asked questions about how people's families were doing and other interactions Um, beside daily friendly interactions. And I think that this is something that I think really highlights how much we can see this daily presence and participation of Jews in a city from which they were banned. And sort of along those lines, once we're thinking about Jews as very much present in the Christian city, we can start asking other more intense questions about how they impacted, participated uh, in Christian life in the city. And one of the reasons that I think the 16th century is such an exciting time for exploring these questions is because during the 16th century, the city of Strasbourg was undergoing the Protestant Reformation. It was one of the most important cities in the Protestant Reformation. It has a fascinating history where it doesn't really adopt Lutheranism at first, and then it does adopt Lutheranism, where you have the gardeners coming to their parish church and tearing down the icons and setting them on fire in a statement that they want reform. You have tensions with all different reformers, and the reformers leaving the city. So it's a very dramatic location for the Reformation, and we can ask questions about the Jews' attitude toward the Reformation, the Jews' knowledge about the Reformation, and even what role they may have had in thinking about some of the issues of reform that were raised at the time. And this brings me to the second category that I would like to look at together with you, and that is teaching Hebrew and Judaica. When Christians were interested in learning the Hebrew language or in learning about Judaism, we call that phenomenon Christian Hebraism. And that's not a phenomenon, of course, that starts in the 16th century, but rather, You could date it back to the fourth century with the church father Jerome, certainly 
you could date it to the 12th century when medieval scholars were very much interested in the Hebrew language and in Jewish themes, and we have many examples of this from the Middle Ages. But there's a very new and heightened interest in Judaic and Hebrew in the 16th century, one that grows stronger in the Renaissance with this desire to learn subjects and sources in the language of the primary source, so wanting to read the Bible in Hebrew. We see that already in the Renaissance. And the Reformation just heightens this desire as Protestant reformers want to translate the Bible on their own, leaving the Vulgate behind. They want to write new vernacular translations, so they go back to the old Hebrew. They want to write new interpretations of Protestant theology, and so they look to rabbinic sources to try to understand the literary meaning, the, the, the literal meaning of the text, um, and they really do turn to Jewish sources for that. And many of the reformers learn Hebrew. Many of the first reformers were, of course, Renaissance humanists themselves. And when we look at the city of Strasbourg and its famous reformers, here I have uh, one of them, Wolfgang Capito, up on, uh, the, on the PowerPoint screen. He also learned Hebrew. He was taught Hebrew by a Jew. And he is very interested in learning Hebrew texts, publishing um, commentaries based on Jewish texts, explicitly citing Jewish texts. In fact, some of his colleagues said, you're really citing Jewish texts a little bit too much. You want to scale back on that Jewish side of your interpretation. But this, this phenomenon was very important to the internal rhetoric of the Reformation. And I'd like to give one example. We could give many. We could, we could fill a year-long class of examples. I'd like to bring one example that I think really speaks to the importance of local Jews in the process of reformers thinking about their own theological queries and making their own theological arguments. And the example I'd like to bring deals with Wolfgang Capito, a reformer. I'm just looking at the map, he's located in Strasbourg, which is the top blue. And he writes a letter to his counterpart in Geneva. That's John Calvin's Geneva. John Calvin's second in command, Guillaume Farrell. He writes a letter to Farrell. And what the subject of his letter is something that's happening in Freiburg and Breisgau, which you can see right over there. What happens in Freiburg, a Catholic city? Well, in Freiburg and Breisgau, the Catholics say they have a new relic. They say they have the burial shroud of Jesus. And everybody is very excited about this because to come and see a relic, to come see a relic of Jesus' burial is something that for medieval, in the world of medieval piety was very important. But it's something that's really anathema to the Protestant reformer who doesn't believe in relics, who has abandoned that theological approach. And what Capito wants to do is not only say, well, you shouldn't believe in relics, and he's talking to the people but he wants to say, you know what, that's not even a relic. He wants to disprove that it is a relic. What's his method? He's a good Hebraist. He says, I'm going to use Jewish sources to show you that that can't possibly be Jesus' burial shroud because Jesus was Jewish, and that burial shroud looks absolutely nothing like a Jewish shroud. <laughs> and so he does some really interesting things. He consults his vast Jewish library, which he has in Strasbourg, and he shows off talking about the different rabbinic sources that he's read and that he has, and also the ones he hasn't read and pretends to have read, which is really interesting, too. But he does something else. He says, I talked to a local Jew. I just want to show you the letter. This is the letter, and I have a close-up just to give you a sense. It's in Latin, but if you look carefully where I've made the red circle, he writes some words in Hebrew. I don't know if you can make it out because I tried to blow it up without... Uh, blurring the image too much, but he writes some of the words in Hebrew with Hebrew citations, but some of what he says is, I talked to a local Jew in order to find out about burial uh, customs. And what he basically does is use the text and use the discussion to show that this shroud absolutely does not conform, and Pharrell thinks this is terrific. He says, you've done great work. This is clearly not the shroud. Nobody's going to see the shroud. Everybody's going to be a good Protestant. Of course, that's not what happens, but they were very excited about their work. But this content, this, this, this content is fascinating because what he's essentially doing is not just relying on the library, but finding somebody to talk to, saying to the local Jew, tell me, how do you bury the dead? How is it different than the book that I'm reading from the 14th century? How is it different from the Talmud? What do you guys do now? 
Of course, Jesus was not buried in the 16th century, so it doesn't really matter how the 16th century Jews were burying their dead. And we can all see that. But he really wanted to show his erudition. And part of that was dialogue with the Jews. So at the exact moment, as his mentor, Vinfeling, is saying, this is a great city, there are no Jews, Capito is saying, someone find me a Jew who knows something about burial, because I've got to talk to those Catholics in Freiburg and show them that's not the shroud. So you can see how much the Jew is a part of even a dialogue between Protestants and Catholics. Now, I think this kind of contact is absolutely fascinating, but it also brings us to a third category, because what it does is it demonstrates that there were personal relationships between reformers and the Jews. There was someone who connected Wolfgang Capito to a Jew that knew something about burial. We can't make the argument we could have made in the 12th century and say, well, it was his next door neighbor. He doesn't have a next door neighbor who's Jewish. Someone has to find him, either a Jew who's walking around Strasbourg trading or lending money, or someone has to make a connection and he has to say to one of those Jews whom he knows, listen, which one of you is in charge of burial? I'd like to talk to the burial guy because I've got an issue in Freiburg and I really want to sort of underscore that this means that those kind of conversations that I suggested happened before are happening. We can't see them in the letter, but we know from the letter that they must have been happening. Now, in the case of Wolfgang Capito, the person who introduced him to the local Jew in charge of burial may have been none other than the very famous Jew of this time, Jossel of Rosheim, who was known as the commander of German Jewish, uh, Jew, the German Jewish community. He was the liaison between the entire Jewish community of the Holy Roman Empire and various leaders, the emperor, the Protestant reformers. And the reason I say this is because Jossel was a native of Alsace, and we know that he knew Wolfgang Capito. I'm going to bring just a few examples of that. Josef Rosheim has a sort of diary, it's not exactly a diary, sort of chronicle of his life. And he has this wonderful quote. He says, I myself, this is actually not from his chronicle, this is from a letter that he wrote to another Jewish community in Hebrew. So this is the English translation. He says, I myself listened several times to the great learned doctor Wolfgang Capito on account of his great scholarship. When he means listen to, he means I attended his sermons in his church. However, when he preached about issues of faith, and this was uncomfortable for me, I departed. I think that's telling us something really interesting. At least this one Jew is going into church and listening to his friend preach about Protestantism. It's not what we expect in the city without Jews, but he's, he's just telling us what happened. And they had a very strong relationship because, in fact, in 1537, when the Jews of Saxony were going to be expelled, they turned to none other than their representative, Jossel of Rosheim. And Jossel of Rosheim wants to speak to the most influential man in Saxony, Martin Luther. It's hard to speak to Martin Luther. He's a really important person. <laughs> it's especially hard if you're a Jew living on the other end of the Holy Roman Empire. So what does he do? Wolfgang, uh, uh, he goes to Wolfgang Capito, who's a good friend of Martin Luther and a colleague. And he says, can you make a letter of introduction to me? And we have here, if you see, this is a, the printed works of Luther. Number 332, Wolfgang Capito to Luther, and he writes Luther a letter saying, I'd like to introduce you to my dear friend, Jossel of Rosheim. He'd like to chat with you about this whole expelling the Jews from Saxony issue. And Luther ultimately refuses to meet with Jossel for reasons that are beyond the scope of this presentation. But Wolfgang Capito tries to help Jossel out. And it's not just a relationship between Wolfgang Capito and Jossel, because you could say, well, that's just, you know, one example of two elite men that are friends with one another. Jossel actually has a wonderful relationship with the magistrates of Strasbourg and negotiates with them countless times on behalf of the Jewish community, securing them refuge during times of war, negotiating longer business hours and saying, you know that bell that you ring? Maybe you can make it ring two hours later. That would be really beneficial. So we see him as an active person. And when he wants to meet with Luther, he also asks Strasbourg city magistrates to get involved. And he says, please, can you write on my behalf? And they do. And so it's actually quite interesting. And I think one of the most fascinating examples of the interactions between Yussel and the city magistrates, not just this instance, but in 1543, Luther publishes three treatises against the Jews, the most famous, which is the last one, on the Jews and their lives, which, if you haven't read it, is a very anti-Semitic text. <laughs> Um, advocating for all kinds of things, like burning synagogues and, and the like. And Yossel of Rosheim is quite worried 
and he does not want this text to be published in Strasbourg. And so he approaches the city magistrates and says, I'm worried that this is going to cause an outbreak of violence. Obviously not in the city, because there are no Jews living in the city, but perhaps in the city when the Jews come in every day, or in the countryside. The magistrates also control certain areas of the countryside. And the magistrates, who are Lutheran, say, we are going to suppress this text. And they, in fact, censor the publication of this anti-Semitic tract in Strasbourg, which I think speaks of volumes as to how much Jews were a part of life in this city, in which really, officially, they didn't belong, because they convinced Lutheran magistrates not to publish a treatise by Luther. And I think, really, for me, that's, I think, a really, really strong uh, evidence to this presence of Jews and to their, I don't want to say their centrality, but their participation in the life of the city. Now, these three categories, economics, uh, teaching Hebrew and Christian Hebraism, and personal relationships, all demonstrate that Jewish-Christian relations were very much a part of daily life for both Jews and Christians in the early modern period, even in areas which were renowned for having expelled their Jewish residents. And because of that, I think it's also very important, and, and, and Barbara mentioned this in her talk for an early period, to understand that these relationships are complicated, um, not always positive, and most of all, dynamic. And the tenor of the relations between Jews and Christians shifted in all three of these categories in the late 16th century and into the 17th century and beyond because of what happens in the city of Strasbourg. And that is that starting from about 1570, Strasbourg becomes a much more orthodox Lutheran city. What that means is they adopt a different confession, a different line of belief, and they try to change some of their practices. As I said, the history of the Reformation in Strasbourg is very rich and very complex, and they adopted different theological confessions, and then they decide, okay, well, we're going to become very Orthodox Lutherans and be very strict. And part of expressing that new Orthodox behavior was curtailing the contact that they had with members of different confessions, be they Catholics, be they Calvinists, be they Anabaptists, Schoenfeldians, and above all, Jews. And what we see at the end of the Reformation, what I would call the late Reformation from 1570 until 1648, are changes in all of those realms. And I just would like to briefly share those changes with you. First of all, we see the annulment of the contract. Starting in 1570, the city magistrates say, we are annulling the contract. We don't want any more Jews here. We don't, we don't want to keep the terms of the contract. Don't come to our courts. Don't do business here. Now, Good historians know that just because somebody says something is a law doesn't mean anybody's listening to it. We still have court cases between Jews and Christians after 1570, but far fewer court cases. And we still have Jewish-Christian interactions that are economic, but they're not always in the city. Sometimes they're on the outskirts of the city. We can trace them on other rows just outside the city. But it's still a change. It's a change of Jewish presence in the city because it's not as welcomed and it's certainly not as central. It's much more physically, spatially marginalized. A second example is that Protestant reformers urge students of Hebrew, and Hebrew was a required subject by this time for anybody studying Protestant theology in Strasbourg's by then university. They urge them not to study with Jews. Here's a quote from Strasbourg's theology faculty in 1644. No Christian should study the Hebrew language with Jews when he can study with Christian teachers. If someone attaches himself to one of these despised people, those being the Jews, he'll be treated in many unjust and annoying ways as a self-evident. It is irresponsible to frequent Jesuit schools and when an evangelical school is available, it is even more irresponsible to look for Jewish teachers for the study of the Hebrew language when there is no lack of Christian teachers. And one wonders if the theology uh, faculty is actually suggesting that if there were no Protestant teachers available, it would be preferable to study with a Catholic teacher than a Jewish teacher. It's really a very questionable sentence, but it's clear that they do not want their students to continue to learn Hebrew um, and study Hebrew with Jewish teachers, but rather they want to do it all inside their own theology faculty, which by 1644 they can do. They've been doing it for 120 years, so they have lots of textbooks and lots of internal resources possible, but the attitude has shifted. And finally, uh, with the example of censorship, we saw that 
Luther's on the Jews in their lives was censored in 1543. But when we look at later texts from the 17th century, published in Strasbourg by the theology faculty, we see them quoting with footnotes, with page numbers, extensively from On the Jews and Their Lives. So this is a book that is no longer censored, but that is very much present in Strasbourg's libraries, and that is used in their own internal theological writings, which they publish. And we also see, starting in this period, various examples of anti-Semitic artwork, which we can't really see in the earlier periods. So we see a rise in all of these things. And Again, this is just to show that what we see is a dynamic changing relationship, one that changes in the city. As the city changes, the relationship between Jews and Christians changes. And I don't think this undermines the basic premise that I'm trying to promote here, which is that Jews are very much a part of what's happening in this city, sometimes more so, sometimes less so, but they're part of the story, they're part of the narrative, even after the expulsion. So to conclude, Although the outline of the history of the Jews in Strasbourg would suggest that there is absolutely no story to tell about Jewish-Christian relations from 1390 until 1791, in fact, there is a complex and dynamic narrative that can be recounted. Archival sources permit us to see that as the Reformation altered life in Strasbourg, Jewish-Christian relations were also affected. While at first glance, such a history is hidden, much like the Colmar treasure, a closer look allows us to reconstruct Jewish presence and the relationships between Jews and Christians on a daily basis, even after the expulsion. Thank you. That was wonderful, all of you, and I, um, I'm just so grateful to have had those three things. I think that's left us a lot to think about, and so now if our three speakers will um, come up and um, take questions, and do um, you want to field things? Sure. Okay, okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put up uh, the main yeah. Right, so um, do you want to respond to each other before we open it up? Do you want to? Yeah, okay, open it up. So, questions from the, or comments from the audience? Oh, yes. It's always terrific to hear, and thank you all. It's very exciting. Um, how these communities got together, lived cheek by jowl, everything was great. <laughs> If you're responding. Um, first of all, that's a fabulous question. And um, honestly, I don't know if we really have a good answer. Um, if we look back at one of the first instances of violence, the 1096 um, riots that I was referring to, if you noted, and this is something that I think is worth mentioning, um, the people who instigate the violence in the Rhinish communities, both in Cologne and in the uh, um, Shum communities, are wayfaring peoples. They are the incited mob that are not the locals. The locals, some of them, some of them, kind of join in, not all. And as society is, it's fragmented in its relationship towards this minority that lives in its midst, right? Some people continue having very strong amicable relationships with Jews. Some extend their hospitality and protection 
the Jews who survived the riots and who write the story and who tell the story of what happened are people who survived because Christians extended a hand, protection, or even uh, put forward an army or protective areas like um, um, the Archbishop Herman III of Cologne. So th I think the, the, your question is, in, of course, in place. But again, as society is, it's very varied. The um, reaction towards these ruptures um, is very, is, is very uh, different among different social strata. You can imagine, of course, that someone who is indebted to the Jews up to their earlobes would treat such an incident very differently from a person who is on a business relationship with the Jews and is uh, very tightly knitted into, um, they're both tightly knitted into one economy. So I guess it's not an answer to your question, but I think it intensifies the problematics. Do you have I would, um, I would, thank you, Marta. I would, I would agree with Effie in the case of Strasbourg, it's, it's complicated. We have the mayor on the one hand in 1349 protecting the Jews while some of the burghers who are in debt are those attacking the Jews and the, lo the loans being annulled. I think it's very important because the plague doesn't really hit Strasbourg, it's fear of the plague. But I really wanna talk about fear for a moment and say, what we didn't talk about tonight is some of the tensions between Jews and Christians that also exist, theological and otherwise. And uh, in moments of fear or tension or defining the self and moments of really needing to strengthen one's own identity, which is, I think, what you see in the late Reformation, I think drawing a boundary and thinking about who is inside and who is outside the boundary is something that we see happening. And the Jews are the outsiders, even in the Reformation, when you have Catholics and Protestants and various kinds of Protestants, the Jew, the hermeneutical Jew, not the Jew who is your neighbor, uh, is a likely candidate for scapegoating, for fear, and for just saying, you're not like us. And I think we have a long history of that to draw on in moments of tension and fear and angst. And I would just add to that, that I think one of the things that we see in the case of Strasbourg, and this is related to what you said as well, is after the expulsion, it's easier to draw those lines because even if you have a business relationship with someone, they're no longer your neighbor. They're not the person you see when you go out to the marketplace in the morning. And I think after 1570, if you go further into the 17th and even the 18th century, where there are really few Jews entering the city of Strasbourg, if you look at the late 18th century debates between urban Strasbourg burghers about whether Jews should become citizens, they have so little in common with the rural Jews who live in the towns and villages around them, that I think that dialogue um, becomes more difficult. So I think living in close proximity is something that can help erase some of those tensions, and coming from afar is something that can heighten those tensions. Um, I would just add a couple of other little anecdotal things. Even during the plague, extraordinarily, there, there are letters exchanged between Jewish doctors, actually a Jewish doctor in Erfurt, with Christian doctors writing to each other and saying, what are you doing? To, have you got any solution to this for your patients? So um, there are those kinds of respectful exchanges happening at the same time as these, as these dreadful pogrom. Um, in, in the case of Colmar, within, and I'm gonna forget the year, but I think it was 1333, there were bands of brigands, maybe you remember the date of the arm later, and they're going around and basically beating up Jews in the villages and towns of Alsace. And some of those Jewish residents of other towns come to Colmar, and Colmar takes them in, not just the Jewish citizens, but the very town says, yeah, you come on in, and, they, and the city makes a, makes a decision that they're gonna keep these uh, rough, roughnecks, ruffians, out of Kumar. And yet, within less than a decade, you have the massacre at the time of the Black Death. Curiously, there were, uh, um, I, I was looking at the wine harvest, because of course, Kumar's economy um, and much of Alsace depended heavily, as it does still today, on wine, and there were two very bad harvests just before the outbreak mm. of the Black Death, 1347 and I think the 3045. And uh, when we had an evening about Colmar with Yotam Otolenghi recently, he said, well, it looks to me as if 
you know, nature turns on us, and when that happens, we turn on each other. Mm -hmm. It gets back to the concept of fear, and uh, I don't know. And yes, sir. Yes, sure. Hi, uh, this is a question for Deborah. Um, Deborah, you know I'm a very practical person, and I would like to ask about the practical aspect of being a money lender in an outside town or village coming into a major metropolis. How do I do that? And do I have a space or a place other than just a canvas model? Or how, what do you know about the physical act of money lending in that in those conditions? I'm so happy to talk about that. <laughs> I'm gonna, I, I'll keep it brief, but I can talk to you about it more later. You have to, first of all, pay an entrance fee to come into the city. And depending on the year, sometimes you have to be searched or even escorted if you're Jewish. And you actually need a special uh, slip of paper called a safe conduct, which is a kind of early modern passport to enter into the city. And these could sometimes be issued, they're issued to a specific person with a name. They could be issued for a certain amount of time to come in and out of the city. And that's what you would need just to get in the city walls. Most of the time, for the period of the contract, the Jews could go anywhere in the marketplace. And we don't know enough about the physical layout. Did they have a shop, or did they just sort of sit in a known place within the marketplace? We don't have any sources about that. Uh, but we do know that they were in the marketplace. And as time goes on, specifically after 1570, from, from the period from 1570 to 1648, we do see Jews being relegated to specific sort of marginal marketplaces, sort of the horse market or the corn market, which are not the main marketplaces in the city, but other side markets, and that's where you could find the Jews. Ultimately, when the city decides to really ban all Jews from money lending in the city, which doesn't mean they weren't coming in anyway, but that's a whole separate story, there were these roads that were sometimes known as the Yudish Vig, which means the Jewish road, and they were roads that were not controlled by imperial uh, decree or by imperial lands, and the Jews could be found there in this sort of no man's land, and people knew where to find them in order to um, borrow money from them. So that's, that's what we know so far. I will usurp my position, and I want to make a comment about how important it is to tell these stories of uh, Jews being part of that uh, larger society. And it is really uh, painful to see how, in the case of the Colmar treasure that is then moved to the French Jewish uh, Museum and disembodied from the Christian context. Because disembodying it, creating that separate story, essentially allows for Jews to be excluded from the life of the society and therefore from, uh, from society altogether. And, and then for scholars, it, it means that they replicate by just telling the story of the Black Plague, of the massacre here, they are replicating the language and vocabulary and the ways of thinking about Jews um, unconsciously. Um, and, and that Jews are only persecuted, killed, massacred, mm -hmm. plundered, and, and there is almost no other possibility for Jews to, to, to be part of a society. And this is obviously a false story, but that's the story that is told by these, some of these Christian sources and then replicated because scholars focus on these massacres rather than on the much more difficult way of, as we've seen, of unearthing the life. And share, telling that shared story, and I really appreciate, Barbara, your uh, comment on, 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 on moving beyond the treasure of the plague, but into the life of, of really uh, telling the shared stories, because that's how we can change slowly, 
too slowly, but, but imagining the shared past and the sh shared society. So, yeah, I, any questions, comments? I, I just wanted to throw this in. I actually think that's a wonderfully optimistic yeah. note to, to wrap up. Okay, so thank you for coming and join us for other projects. Thank you.